All right. Let's make sure everybody's working. Everything's There's okay. an extra person here. Oh. Oh, I know. Two... It's his twin. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to figure out which one is the evil twin. <laughs> don't trust me. I have one. one. I'm a twin. Okay, oh, you are. Okay. Like... Yeah, so don't 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 trust either one of them. Don't trust okay. either one of them. Uh let me uh adjust something here. Now, can you see me at all? Yes. Okay, then that's what counts. <laughs> we won't go over this again. I'll lose my mind if I try to explain it. Um, but it looks like it's working. Um, we're, it's going to be a little... Uh, we actually have somebody else joining us, Dorothy. We are just talking about her, remember? Um, oh, she's... Have some technical difficulties here. That's uh, okay. We're getting settled in ourselves. I'm trying to. We know all about technical difficulties. Oh, that's for boy. sure. Yeah, and I can't really. I got that one that comes up with all of us, and I, I said I wanted to get rid of that. Remember? Well, you guys can't see it, but if you guys are out there watching on. No, I see it. The one with all of us. Yeah, it's over and over and over. It's kind of like it's crazy, but whenever you guys talk. Well, anyway, so Dorothy, yeah, hang in there. We're still kind of getting settled in. We're in Acts chapter 17. We're hoping I got the chat up. I, I see it's uh, it's working. We're getting some connection there. Hey, Chelsea, yes, uh, I see you guys in here, the audio. Yeah, the audio is good, Chelsea says. Um, so, yeah, lots of us. Um, yeah, we're having a bunch, so... Yeah, it's going to be fun this morning. We're in Acts chapter 17. We're going to be jumping down to uh, verse 16, looking at the Apostle Paul as he comes into Mars, into uh, Athens. And that's going to be, uh, there's a lot of things that we can really, I think, pull out of this. And it's going to be very useful. Um, let's see, I'm trying to help Dorothy. I'm not sure. We, well, you no, know, all the audio is going to be coming through the same and consistent as far as that goes. So. Well, all right, so um, let's get kind of started here. I'm going to start out by showing, I'm going to flip around. I want to talk about the geographics and bring up the map, but I have to kind of switch around here, switcheroo, so that I can, I got too many computers running. All right, so let's talk geography. I love geography. Um, it's at least a word I can pronounce. But when we look at it, you know, you see the way that the red line there and the way that they're coming along and traveling through Mysa, Troas, and then Samathres and across down. And then Berea is where we left them about three weeks ago, um, right after they left Berea. If Thessalonica was a bad situation, of course, pursued and left there, goes to Berea. Berea, the people were different. We have a unique description about them as being very fair-minded. And uh, the only problem was that the people coming from Thessalonica pursued down, right? And they come down there and pursue him. And, and then all of a sudden we see where he has to depart. And the brethren there assist in getting him out. If you'll notice the arrow travels along the coastline, they put him on a ship. And then by ship, he travels down and eventually ends up in Athens. And so uh, now he leaves uh, Silas and Timothy behind and he's waiting on them. That's where we come in and we, we see at the uh, last part of verse 15, it said that after they escorted him and he gets as far as Athens, he sends a command. He wants Silas and Timothy to come with him as soon as possible. And so they're heading towards him. So we're at a waiting point while he's sitting down here in Athens. Now, Athens is an amazing place. Um, if you look at some of the geography, this is 
what is left of or considered Mars Hill. If you look there, you see down to the bottom kind of left, you see there's actually this stairwell. And you see here's my little mouse and kind of a parking area. There's an inscription, a plaque that has actually Paul's sermon on it. And that stairwell then takes you up to the top where all these people are. And I don't, I don't know what was there. I mean, it's, I mean, when they come to me, but it's, it's a, it, look at the prominence. That's the thing. Mars or Areopagus is another name, but they're both named for gods. The same God, one's Greek, one's Roman. Uh, Roman God was Mars. Arius was the Greek. And that's one of the things that they would do. The Acropolis is across the valley there. But this is that stairwell that still exists as you go up and approach. And it, it, I think it would be awesome to go and see something like that. But So we see him coming up. That's kind of the approach to it. This is looking across from Acropolis, the amazing... Uh, I guess it was what the Persians, I think, burned it down. But one of the things that they, they would do is they would take these large hills and they would place their gods or temples upon them. And I think I, I know I do. I got a picture here. Acropolis. There it is across the other side there. So imagine this view. You're, whenever we come to him and giving his uh, speech there, I gotta make a little bit of a audio adjustment. I'm getting a little bingy on the, there we go. Okay, so I just can't imagine when we look at the, the views while you're on top of there looking around and just the culture screaming at you as a Jew um, that's traveled in through these areas and we'll talk a little bit more about the culture and so uh, we'll come back to that in just a minute as we go along. Um, so Paul, you know, when we find Paul here waiting, um, I don't think that he was trying to take a vacation. This is not something that we, you know, we think of him waiting. I don't, I don't see Paul ever slowing down. Um, what are y'all thoughts? Just to make sure I'm getting audio, I'm kind of nervous. Thanks for sharing the maps. Looks good. Now in 15, when it says uh, that he that Paul had asked for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, I just think it's a transition to say he was waiting for them at Athens. Yeah. Yeah, verse 16 says that uh, in, in my version here. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him. So it's, for what he saw in the city, yes. I think what we see is we see a hasty exodus where he wasn't able to take them with him. And so when he got there, he was just waiting like a pause before he just continued on, right? I mean, he's just kind of waiting around, waiting for this to happen. And so he's he's waiting for them in Athens, and this is what happens. Now, there's there's a couple of things that I thought of as I was kind of going over this. I thought to myself... Um, what did Paul see? What did he uh, feel? And this is what we see, what, what's going to come out, I think, in these first couple of verses. Of what did he see? What did he feel? And where did he go? This is an amazing application that we can apply to ourselves and we can look at and figure out, well, how did, what was Paul's approach? And I think we've been doing that pretty good. We've uh, tried to take and make this an approach that we can look at. And how did he approach the environments that he was in, the cultures that he was facing? And now we know as he's in, in Greece here, it's it's a completely different culture. Way out of his comfort zone, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring up the Bible, and we're going to read. This is... Uh, Starting in, and I'm actually, I'm going to change over my version. I'm just used to. 
So now I'm going to start reading. We're in Acts chapter 17, in case you're joining us. If not, you can read along with me here in Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to Areopagus saying, may we, may we know what this, is new, this new teaching is that you're presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived in there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So let's start at the beginning. So what did he see? city full of idols and in in verse 17 where it says it it uh on verse 16 where it provoked him i'm hoping that today with what we see going on that our hearts would be provoked also with seeing things that are going on that we know are not uh scriptural anybody else Becky took my thought. I, I was thinking that same thing. I mean, are we provoked within by all the sin that we see around us, or are we just comfortable with it because that's the world we live in? I think it's something just, we need to ask ourselves. Just say, well, that's the way it is nowadays. And then can we, we be, accept it? Mm-hmm. Can we be provoked by it, but still maintain the right attitude? where we don't look spitefully at people we look down our noses at them, but have kind of an attitude of Paul and have some uh, love for people, even pity for people who are in darkness, rather than becoming a bitter towards them. And it can be hard not to sometimes if you're overwhelmed by all of that, but uh, it's a challenge to have the right attitude. It's easier in one extreme just to ignore it, say that's just the way it is, you have to accept it or to be filled with rage all the time, but to walk in the middle of it. And I don't see Paul, he's provoked. I'm not sure how you interpret that to mean, but I don't take it to mean he's angry or hateful at people, but he's moved to talk. And we see what he does. He, at least in my translation, verse 17, he reasoned with people. As always, he reasons with them. He converses with them. How I can provoke is that they are that it moves him to teach so we should be provoked to teach what is right exactly and where did he go he went to the synagogue where he knew a lot of people would be and where a lot of people wanted to hear well that that word provoke there is to stir up and then you know it's I just thought of my childhood whenever my mom said, you are provoking him when he punched you in the face, you know, your brother. So (laughs) there is an aspect where we think that it provoked him in anger, but that's not what really, I I was just looking at the Greek, you know, the background there and it's, it, it can have kind of that in, but we know that's not his spirit. That's not, that it would be more of a highly motivation. And I like the comments you guys are talking about how if we think about what do we see when we're living in the world every day. Now, Paul saw something that was extremely offensive to him, very offensive to him on a, on a very uh, a level that I don't think we can comprehend because what was an idol to a Jew? It was a bad thing. I mean, it was horrific for the, a Jew to have anything in an idol. And what's amazing, if we go back and kind of look at the history, we know that it was something God, you know, said in the Mosaic Law. We know they didn't follow it, did they? What, what did they do? They, they turned right around and they were building idols. What's fascinating, and I'm not sure if you guys remember this, but after the return 
that idol worship wasn't a problem anymore. That's, that's what's amazing is when they came out from Babylon and they started rebuilding, idols were gone. You don't hear of that again. Before that, that was one of the major reasons of the judgment that came against them. Was the, And so here's Paul. He's walking around, and he, what does he see? He sees all things that are so morally, and morally, I say, because of what they represent. They represent things that, I mean, think about some of the, the gods that they were worshiping, and some of the things that they were worshiping were, you know, self-satisfaction, pleasurable, and, and that to him was a moral insult. Today, like what you guys are saying, when we look around, what do we see? What do we see? Um, we don't see fixed idols. But what is the essence of an idol? What, what does an idol mean to us today? And do we have them today? Yeah, it's, an idol is something that you put before God. It could be TV. It could be um, anything that you put above God. An idol implies a, a great level of devotion to it as well. And certainly that point's true. Anything you put above God, they, they certainly had a religious aspect to it. And I put forth that people have made an idol out of Jehovah God, the Lord God, by turning him into a, whatever they want. It's the same spirit of idolatry. They say, oh, I don't believe in idols. I believe in the God of the Bible, but... They change him, they adapt him, they uh, customize him to whatever they want and say, this is the God I believe in. God I believe in would approve of how I live and what I do. And the God I believe in, by the time they're done, it's like you've kind of created an idol. You, you've made up another God. Even though you call him the God of the Bible, you've, you've really made your own God. And one of the, you think what was so attractive about idols, one of the attractive things is that you make up your own rules for what your God approves of and accepts, and that's what people do with the Lord God as well. I agree, but I think also that uh, people who worship man-made, handmade idols, uh, they can speak to that thing and think that that is the one that's going to be answering them. Uh, I walk, and there's a, a house that they have all these idols outside, big, huge, huge statues. And when I walked by and saw that they just keep adding to this yard, yeah. these handmade idols, I said, it reminded me of the Bible, the scripture that says they they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't have, they don't hear. They have a mouth, but they don't speak. And, and I just pray. I pray that they would come to the truth. Does it provoke you? It provokes, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, it does. I'm thinking, I wish you knew the true God, the creator of this world. So that, that is something that I want to explore because, again, we're trying to look at the idea that this is an experience that's not unique to Paul, is it? This is something that we experience, and we should. And I think that's a problem, isn't it? Where we stop becoming provoked? Things don't bother us anymore? I mean, can you imagine a time where Paul would just walk through a city full of idols and just not even notice them? Well, of course, if you live in that atmosphere, you can't walk around every day just pulling your hair out. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of, okay, this is where I am and this is what people do. But at the same time, you never settle with it to the point that you shrug your shoulders. You're, you're always concerned about it. And it, you know, we live in a mindset today where everybody's right in their own ways. Who are you to judge somebody else? That's their religious and their, their religion and custom. You should respect that. And I don't want to be a bad guy that, that comes across as ugly and wagging my finger at everybody. Everybody's doing it wrong. But, but you have to get back to what, what's at stake here. This is people's souls are at stake. And God's name is at stake. And so we must never lose our, our concern and our love for people that we look for 
opportunities to try to direct them to truth. I agree. Uh, Chelsea says, I wonder if he saw worldly great thinkers, in quotations, and respected it. But maybe he counted on if they really had an open mind to think, they would have easily seen God, their unknown God, with open minds. Uh, I, I, I do, I think Paul would have respected their education. I think he would have looked at them as being, I, I, I think he would have had the reality of knowing that these men had the capabilities to understand it. But at the same time, we know that not many wise and not many, you know, that are set in their ways will accept it. I think he did respect it. Um, yeah, and, and notice, I'll probably cut you off there, but in verse 22, I know I'm getting ahead of us here. He doesn't, he, he addresses them when he goes to Mars Hill. He doesn't say, men of Athens, you horrible, terrible idolaters, how dare you? People disgust me worshiping these idols. You, you, you're so stupid. How, how can you not? It's not how he addresses them, does it? There, there's a, a certain respect there. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you were very religious. Mm -hmm. And I've been studying the different objects of your worship. And then he starts to direct it to, to teach them. And so he's never insulting, belittling, any of those sayings, he looks and says, you're very religious. It's a good thing. You recognize there is such a thing as deity, mm -hmm. and there must be someone who created things. So he kind of starts from that and builds from there. And I think that's a very good lesson for us in, in how we talk as well. I, I don't see him looking down on people at any time here or losing us cool or anything. No. And, and I think that what's amazing is the way that he's able to adapt you know, Paul has that ability to keep the beautiful spirit, keep the calmness, the strength, but adapt, adapting to it. So where did he go? Well, we know it's clearly it says he went to the synagogue, which was something we've already seen him do a lot. And then he also devout persons. So devout, devout to what? And I believe that these are maybe specifically within this group of the synagogues or others that were devoted, maybe like a Cornelius that was, um, you know, somebody who was devout and to the Jews and their culture, maybe like that. But he's addressing specific people who have an interest. And then he's going out into the public. He's going out into the, the community. And as he goes in through the marketplace, it's, you know, he's talking to those who are there as well, right? So one of the things that is kind of interesting is who he's up against. And that's another thing is you need to know who you're talking to, right? Um, so the first people we find that he, one of the groups that is specifically mentioned here are the Stoics. Um, and they're, you know, they come from a, a philosophy that comes from Zeno, a sitem, about 300, 300 years before Christ. So they believe that a wise man should be free from passion, unmoved by joy, grief, submission, and natural law. So you repel against natural law, or apparently one professedly indifferent to pleasure or pain. Um, and so the Stoics, one of the most famous ones was Emperor Marcus Aurelius. And to this day, I still see people, and even Christians, you know, use a lot of his quotes. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that it's sinful. I think there's a lot of the philosophy that they do have. It's pretty smart, and it's very much in parallel with, with what the Proverbs teach. It's common. Uh, but the Stoics... You know, you can see right away they should be free from passion, unmoved by any emotion, and submission, submissive to natural law. They should not. And so they're indifferent. They should reflect nothing. It kind of reminds me of uh, the, the guards at Buckingham Palace. And they stand there, right? Stoic. 
uh, the soldier, the uh, tomb of unknown soldier, uh, the guard there at the tomb of the unknown soldier, you know, same thing where they stand there and you cannot see or get any impression. That's very intimidating, isn't it? But it also, because why? Um, emotions express a weakness or a vulnerability within you. And so you control it. You know, that, that's something that we see. Then the next group that we see is the Epicureans. And they believe they're hedon. They're hedonistic. Totally around the idea of, of pleasure. They In the physics, they believe that the universe consisted of two things, matter and void. And the matter is made up of atoms, which are teeny bodies that have only unchanging qualities of shape, size, and weight. And so, please yourself. <laughs> And there's no other purpose in it. Um, so is that much different than what we face? Well, the Stoics would also have sort of, uh, the, the, it wasn't just their personality. Right. You know, it's, it's really a philosophy of how to be a, a, good, a good person, a godly person or a spiritual person or have a meaningful life. And some of that they had right in terms of self-control and, and, and things like that they pursued. But of course, they pursued it to extreme and it became their own sort of religion, almost as if self-control was their, was their idol. It, it can, you know, our, our, we should have self-control, but we have a purpose of godliness, not making that. And of course, the Epicureans are on a whole other philosophical uh, track of philosophy there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that their curiosity may have looked hopeful. I agree with Chelsea, what she's saying there, that, you know, their curiosity, then they opened the door, that curiosity opened the door. Um, and the fact that they would, they would do that as well um, is interesting. Chelsea says the group is still out there, ran into a few years ago. Absolutely. No, they're the same type of Philosophies and groups, it hasn't changed. We still have people who are basically Epicureans and Stoics. Those wouldn't, regardless of what you call them, maybe specifically Sto Stoicism or Epicureanism, it doesn't, you, but the ideas are still kind of there. Hedonism, you know, uh, pleasure, enjoy yourself over a cost of everything else. It doesn't matter. I think that's kind of what we see with... Um, a lot of the, the people today. That's why I say these, 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 even though they're so unique in the way that they're being presented in the scripture here, they're not. I mean, there's a lot of things that are exactly the same is what I'm trying to say. Um, so Chelsea said that they were Stoics that she'd run into. Um, so, so those are the type of people. And uh, I thought something else that was kind of interesting. It says, they listened, right? That's that curiosity, I think, Chelsea, you're talking about. They listened because why? Um, what does this babbler say? And, and that is something interesting, isn't it? The way that they use that as speaker and... I'm trying to think, find this here. They do have curiosity. Yes. Well, if you drop down to verse 21, it talks about how the people there um, spent their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So this would have been something new for them to be interested in and you'll know, give some thought to. And you know, there's some things to appreciate about them. Because I meet many people today that have no curiosity spiritually. They have no interest. They have no religion. These people have some sort of religious ideals, and they're willing to listen to people. And so many people today I've tried to talk to that are, are religious, they identify as Christians, they don't want to listen to anything. They want me to sit right down and listen to them, just unload everything they have, and they don't want to, they don't want to listen to anything. Here's the people that at least, they may be off track, but at least there's an audience there, and Paul perceives that. and and uses the opportunity. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting 
the Stoics and the Epicureans are absolutely on the opposite end of the spectrum to me. Mm -hmm. And if they're in one place, are they reasoning with one another? Like what the scriptures tell us? How do they, how do they even listen to one another? If someone is, you talk about a babbler. I mean, I would think that someone would be babbling in the synagogue and saying, no, I'm going to tell you how I feel. And, and that's why I think is wonderful when we have like-mindedness uh, in congregations. Mm -hmm. well, the babble kind of, in our current language, is kind of the idea of something not sensible. Yeah. You know, that we don't understand it. Blah, blah, blah. You know, what? What are you saying? You're babbling. Um, and so, you know, what he was saying was babblings. And... But the, it's, what's interesting is the Greek word is, is a bird that would go and pick up seed from the field from multiple places. I have no idea. You know, I'm kind of lost for, well, I understand the word babble, and I think the translators had it right as far as like, because it is. It's, it's, they're indicating that he has multiple things that are being picked up that they're listening to, and, they, and because that's what he describes. They say that, you know, what there's, you know, he's a preacher of foreign... Uh, divinities, gods, um, and also because of what? He's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Whew. So right there, there's something about the way they perceived life after death, and we know that the, the Epicureans would say, no, you go back to dust and mo molecules. And, and, and I also read something yesterday talking about resurrection, that some of them may even thought that this was another god, because some of the gods, and that they they would put in a sense a status of divinity too would be something like this: a god of resurrection. That he was a unique god of resurrection, spirit after physical existence, something like that. So, well, I think he's talking about foreign deities. They said. Well, that would be foreign. Yeah. Jesus is a foreign deity to them. And, and I think that yeah. um, although those babbling and stuff they didn't understand, they were questioning it. And I think that just goes to show they want to do what is right by God. They don't understand what it is that they need to do. So by questioning him, asking him, I think they truly want to know i would pick on that a little dorothy <laughs> there are some people that they just look and i think the luke is kind of expressing this idea at verse 21 that's all they do all day long they just listen to stuff to make themselves feel good um when I was in college in 1980, way back in the day, I, the student Corbett Center um, was the place to hang out. And we would go there between classes and have coffee. And I right. remember one day I ended up sitting down with a friend of mine that was majoring in philosophy. And he had all his buddies there. And I about lost my mind listening to them. I had to get up and leave. Uh, they were coming up with stuff that was like, who would think of this stuff? Why, why do you go there with your, I mean, it just, and, and even, uh, anyway, that's what it reminds me of, is that they're, they're enticed and, and, you know, excited to hear this. This is something that, I mean, think about it. They probably got tired of hearing themselves all the time. I mean, they, they reach a point where they're out of conversation. You know, we've 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 covered all the stoicism and Epicureanism stuff. Oh, listen to this, Bob. This guy's talking about something different. But it it was genuine to know, and that's what is amazing. Is it? He took advantage of it. He he seizes upon that, doesn't he? To go ahead and take that opportunity, regardless of what their heart was, and that's important for us. Because there's a part of me that if I would have known, and I know Paul does, true Stoics and Epicureans, he would have just said, you're pulling my leg, I ain't wasting my time with you. 
because I know this ain't going to work. I know. I know where you're at. Um, and sometimes we do that based on maybe somebody who has a higher education or different position in life. So that's what I see is that, yes. But I, do, I don't know that they were genuine. They were wanting to know about his God. Maybe that's what you're trying to say, Dorothy. Maybe I'm kind of taking right. it the other direction. Yeah, they were serious about wanting to fight him. But I don't know if it was to save their souls and get rid of sin from their lives. But they don't know yet, do they? Right. So, um, but people who sit around and just yabba, 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 yabba. You know what it reminds me of? People who live on Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, Facebook people. You know, are, are sitting around and doing Snapchats or TikTok or, you know, all that stuff. It's like, that's all they do. You know, I, I, I get asked a lot of times, they'll say, hey, did you see this TikTok or this and that? I'm like, no, uh, no. And they are funny, but are we just sitting around babbling? You know, are we just, just you know, what are we focused on? Um, and so that was the custom of the entire city. It says Athenians as well as foreigners who live there, they would do that. So let's go on. What I see, Ron, what I see too is that uh, he wanted to compliment them. They think they're religious. And so he complimented them by saying, uh, I perceive that in all things that you are religious. And then when he compliments them, it kind of draws them in and then they will listen to him. And that's what we mm -hmm. should take into account also. Some people who think that they know uh, the Bible very well and and can say why they believe the way they do and we can compliment them and say well let's if you want to study let's let's study and make sure that that we're both right well that's why i always say regardless of whether you agree with somebody or it's very offensive to you you have to respect at least if that's what they believe right or wrong that's what you would want you know you'd you'd want people to at least respect your thoughts and your value systems and it, because if if you feel like that they don't you shut them off you're going to shut them and off. we have we have to uh allow them to come to the conclusion on their own after reading what scripture says mm -hmm. we can show them the correct way but then if they're still going to believe their own way you can't just say you will be baptized you you will uh worship on, on Sunday, the first day of the week, you will do this. You will do that. You're never gonna. You're never gonna win them over. This reminds me of the saying that you get more flies with honey than vinegar. <laughs> you know, if you want an opportunity to talk with somebody, you know, you're not gonna start out by insulting them. That's right. You're not gonna get that moment. You're gonna be able to teach. So let's go on to verse 22. I better check out now because I'm about out of time. I was going to say, I always recognize, too, that it's normal and sensible as what we believe is to everybody, to us, to somebody else. What is it to them who's never heard it? It's babble. And so that it takes really takes patience to try to really takes patience to working a little at a time to introduce them to things because uh, the, the will seem as strange to them as they do to us. Mm -hmm. so. Anyhow, I, I'm sorry I have to go. I think. Thanks so much. Wish I could stay, but appreciate it. I'll take care. All right. We'll see you. Okay. All right. So let's go on to verse 22 and read from there. So Paul, standing in the midst of Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of Mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of the dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet 
he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. Being the God's offspring, then, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of imagination of man. These times of ignorance got overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance by all, by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard this, of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out among their midst. But some men joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysus, the Aragonite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. Um... Hold on a second, I gotta. I have one more participant downstairs that I forgot about. Well, I didn't. I got it set up, but he came in a little late. Oh, all right. Let's get back over here and we'll come back to the conclusion of that. We'll look. Um, so what are your thoughts? We start back at the top of this when he's standing in the midst. Now, just imagine. Now, Areopagus is Eris, and it, Opagus is this protrusion, so it's on top of that area where we are talking about. Well, I think with Paul starting out with the unknown god, you know, they know everything there is to know about these other gods, but he wants to tell them something new, something they don't know. So he starts with that unknown god. And I think that was really strategic considering who he was dealing with. Yeah. Chelsea says there are only a few people that are actually open-minded when they declare that they are. <laughs> and that's the truth. You know, a lot of times people say they're open-minded, but are they? are they really? You're right. That was a great intro, wasn't it, for him to do that? And what does that mean about what he was doing when he was looking at these idols? He noticed them, didn't he? Um, he said, I will show them. He started, I will show them the unknown God. I mean, he read the inscription, too. He didn't just mm -hmm. go in there and just break, break them all down and say, these, these are not gods. But then he told them, who is the Lord of heaven and earth? And that this God, this unknown God that I'm going to preach to you is the one who has given us all life, breath, and all things. He is the CIS. Well, so him, he, he gives them the respect that they're religious. And even though to Paul, what's religious compared to what they think? I see that a lot. I unfortunately feel, you know, I, I hear people all the time say, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And I just, th it hit me when, when I was studying this class and I thought of this where Paul looked at them and said, I perceive that you're religious. Now we have people today that there's an unknown God to them, and it's the one true God. They think they know about God, but they don't. Yeah. Yeah, they don't, do they? They really don't. And so it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a little offensive to me. I'll just say it. It's a little offensive to me when people, especially once they find out that I teach Bible and I'm a, a preacher and all this, and all of a sudden, they get all religious on me. 
uh, you know, and all of a sudden they'll, they'll go, oh. And, and from then on, I, a lot of times I'll have people, they'll say a bad word and they go, oh. And they look at me and they go, oh, I'm sorry. It's like. I think we've all experienced that. We all experience it. Well, well, not when. I'll say, your... don't talk like that because Becky wouldn't like that. Exactly. Or, yeah. Be Becky's leaving. Uh, mm -hmm. If if we were somewhere and I'm going to leave and go go worship, oh, well, she's leaving because she has to go to church. And and yet these are you know there's a lot of those same people that you were just described that would probably turn around and say, well, I'm a Christian. Right. Mm -hmm. The religion is the right religion to them. Yeah. So, you know, Paul is looking at these people and he's saying, I perceive that you are religious, you're spiritual, you're, 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 you're connecting beyond a normal level that others don't. So, um, and so he observed, he noticed, he showed respect to their worship. I looked around, I saw what I was seeing and I see, yeah, look at this. They are very religious. But he saw in that, I think that this is where you, we can understand that Paul, as he was watching all this, he's thinking of his apologetic. He's preparing. That's something that we have to do. You just don't jump into an argument and never have a clue of what you were going to say. Well, you can do it, but you're not going to do it as well if you would have just taken the time to think through those scenarios. If you were approached by somebody on the street and asked you about your faith, or if you're sitting more likely, you're sitting in a comfortable environment visiting with people and somebody brings up uh, a very pointed question about your, your, your faith. Um, and, but so Paul looked at that and he used that, prepared it. I think he had already been thinking about it, especially for the moment they went in and said, let's meet with him. Um, well, he knew their gods, but now he was going to introduce the true God. Yep, exactly. Uh, Chelsea says that um, the unknown God has been seen in many ancient cultures as well. Well, you know, in a way, it's uh, who we were just saying that in a way, weren't we? That um, honestly, it he. Oh, I think it was yeah, Derek before he left bringing up the idea that it's still, there's a lot of people who don't know the one true God. And, and so in a way, you may call him the same name, but he's not the same God. He's a different God because man has made him into something that he's not. That's not who he really is. Like you've got one, one character, a real person, but it's almost like they're now an actor. They're playing a different role because it doesn't, it's not the way he's described in the Bible. So this is what you need to know. It's like somebody wanting to know Clark Gable, if anybody even remembers him, or Robert Redford and the different roles. What did you do? You know him? Do you know Robert Redford? But you know him in Jeremiah Johnson and all these other different roles. And that's the way I see that a lot of people approach God. It's like they look at that character like a famous person um, and say, oh, I know that person. But no, you know, like an actor, these different characters that they've played. Yeah, it's like they pick out the characteristics that they want, and they cling to that. Mm -hmm. You notice with Robert Redford, I just named some of my favorite movies that I picked out, because I love, you know, the frontier stuff, and Jeremiah Johnson is one of my favorite ones. So you're right, you know, and so to me, when I see Robert Redford now, and I did, I just saw him at Sundance, some things he'd interviewed. And I listened to him, and all of a sudden I went, whoa, Jeremiah Johnson, chill your jets, man. And I thought, no, that, that's the real Robert Redford. And I don't agree with him. There's a lot of stuff about him. I, uh, mm -mm. And it blew it for me. You ever had that happen? <laughs> that's why I always say, actors, zip it, please. Don't ruin it for me. I want to remain, I want to see you in those roles. But as soon as they start expressing their little opinions, it's like, oh, please, you're an actor. And that, and honestly, that's the way we, I think that most of the people have created God. They've created this, these characters, caricatures from him, but it's not him. You don't really know the God. And so that's where 
Okay, maybe I'm kind of banging this a little too far, you know, as far as like being the unknown God, that he's still there. We still have an unknown God, and they don't even know it, do they? And like you said, he's still there, and like the scripture says, he is not far from each of us. So for people to say it's too hard to comprehend this God that you you believe in. And in 26, he has made from one blood. We all come from one DNA. and It is God's DNA. We are his offspring, every solitary person on this earth. And that's where he's going to start to really fracture them because now he's, remember what we talked about, who, uh, Chelsea says it's officially ruined for me, talking about Hollywood, has officially ruined it for me after the last two years and reading the Bible. It really does, doesn't it? It, it changes your perspectives on things. So, let <clears throat> Ron, I want to just, if I can, point something else out. I really like how Paul, you know, points out that the gods that they have have been made with human hands and they dwell in temples, but he, he sets the true God apart. And showing his power and his authority that he doesn't dwell in temples. He's not made with hands. Um, he's Lord of heaven and earth. You know, he just completely sets the one true God apart from the gods that they know. Mm-hmm. He's alive on, on what you said, Lacey. See, they, when you create an idol like they did, they had to attribute actions back to it because they weren't animated, they weren't real. Statues didn't walk around and do things. The God didn't do anything unless some human said, oh, yeah, you know, Arius, the God of war, he attacked this city. Did you see him do it? No, but he's the God of war, so war happened, so it had to be him. You're attributing those to him. And that's why what's amazing is when you look at the way they conceived how he came into existence is just a little too more complex for us to go to. But the, the basically, fundamentally, is that the idea of one God, the same God, that everything that he's going to describe, no. No, that, that was a little... So when he says that one God made everything, and not only did he make it, you notice he says, what else? He's Lord of heaven and earth. So he didn't make it, and another God rule it. Hmm? the same guy they have different gods that have every different thing don't they Chelsea says they're worshiping man-made things and ideas like a clay pot worshiping itself not looking at its maker which is a silly picture isn't it when you think about it but that's exactly what what is going on So he distinguishes between one with power and creation and one that's sovereign and ruling. And so why does he need anything? See, that's another level of setting apart this God from their gods. They, their gods needed things. It was a different, and that's why I think Paul is bringing this up. No, he doesn't need anything from you. You need something from this God, the God that I'm bringing to you. And that everything has, and Becky, you brought it up already, that we come from one, one nation, one people. And everything that is in existence, he even talks about nations, time periods. I think of different time periods that you can we can look back and one of them is like the bronze ages and those different ages that we have described um and god has allowed those to exist and and come about so everything so is this a god that's asleep no is he so is he and that's another thing i want to ask is has he changed today no this is the same god isn't it He's still determining periods. He is still establishing boundaries and permitting nations to rise and allow them to stay in rule. And Mm -hmm. Chelsea agrees with me. (laughs) She says that 
that he never changes. Yeah. So that means in this still applicable, isn't it? God still doesn't need anything from us. He is still the creator of everything, and he is still sovereign. And that he still determines times. So how, you know, if you forget that he's doing these things, then you don't care and your behavior changes. If you know that he can bring up nations and take nations out, that changes things, doesn't it? And the other thing is, this was made on purpose. He, this, there's a part of a, a link to this idea of who he is about and how he has established everything that comes back to when he starts, when verse 27, that they should do what? They should seek him. You know what this reminds me of? What is this? Does this remind anybody of something in, that Paul writes about? That they should seek him? With their heart, soul, and mind. Yeah, yeah. Not just a fleeting thought. Well, let me bring it here. I'll bring it up and share it with you here. This is in Romans 1. Um, well, we back up here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, for who by their righteousness suppress the truth that what, this is where I was thinking about, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly per perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they did not know God, they did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him, they became futile in their thinkings and foolishness, foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of immortal God for the images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creepy things. Sound close to what we're dealing with, what he's telling them? So there's a, ram of, there's, there's a strong implication that Paul goes on with this. And, and really, he's in Romans there, he's equalizing the playing field that... You know, everybody is responsible. Everybody, and I think that's what he's kind of doing here is he's bringing everybody back to the common origin. That the one God created everything and is permitting things to happen the way they are. He's in charge, he's ruling, but there's an accountability. In verse 31, and that's what he says there's an accountability. Um, and, and he's quoting, um, we don't. They don't really know his sources on some of this, but like in verse 28, this does come back to really a passage over in Job 12. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breadth of all mankind. So they're, they're in being the Holy Spirit, you know, as dwelling in him and assisting him, we see that. Um, and over in Daniel... Daniel is, is talking to the king. He says, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of the heavens and the vessels in this house have been brought in before you. You and your lords, your wives and your concubines, they have drunk from them. Sound familiar? The blasphemy of Belshazzar does. <clears throat> so it's kind of, it, it's just the same message just re-presented to people it's a consistent message, isn't it? <clears throat> the sovereignty of God and our need for him. Now, this is where, for your own poets have said, um, you know, this isn't the only time he's quoted from their own poets, which shows you his, his extent of his education and ex, uh, experience. Over in Titus 1, 
he quotes something there about the Cretans, if you remember, Titus 1.12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are li always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. So, Paul knows his poetry. Paul knows his history. And so, we don't know where this one came from, but there is some credit to some philosophies and some poets in referencing, um, and somebody may know, I just can't recall myself, but I... But he says, for indeed we are of his offspring. Now that my brain cells are kind of working a little more, I do believe there is a kind of a link to a specific. Oh, Artis' poem. The Phenomia. That's where it's being quoted from, which is quite a, quite, yeah, okay. Sometimes it does come, I do find it. <laughs> so, um, if that's true, in other words, we're all from the same God, same creator, same God who rules everything, then now that changes things. And so then in 29, being then God's offspring. Okay, we're, so if you're following his logic as an Epicurean or a Stoic, you're following along. He's saying, if this, if this, if this, then, then. So now I've established the fact, I'm showing you, I'm saying we are all of his offspring. Then if we are, this is how we should focus. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone from an image formed by the art of imagination of man. And that is so true, isn't it? Now, if they're being sincere with themselves and they're looking at their own religiosity, their own religious that they think about it, everything that they've done, they have to shape it. That honestly, you're making your God. And, and that has not changed because there's so many false teachings that claim to come back to the same original God, but what they've done is they've done the exact same thing. Instead of gold and silver and pounding it into an image, they take his doctrine, they pound it and shape it into a new different uh, philosophy. That's not what God wants us to know. That's what Paul talked about in Galatians chapter 1. That right after he had left there, what they do? <sighs> they started listening to somebody who was reshaping it. And so if we are of this God, we need to understand you can't change it according to the imagination of men. Not acceptable. And that's why I love 30. The times of ignorance is overlooked. All right, we're done. <laughs> Put up with us enough. Time of ignorance is God overlooked. But now, see, now this is where it's all coming towards. If we are his offspring, we shouldn't think of him as somebody that we can make. And he's put up and overlooked that, but now, no. Now it's time. And not only to change, he's, and now that repent is very religious, but he's saying turn away from that, that thinking, that, that ideas. And now he's saying that because there's a judgment coming. Whoa, and see, that's where people stop all the time. And honestly, I think that's where most people don't want to accept um, religion because this, a judgment sets a standard in which you may not agree with, which you can... There's accountability. Yeah, there you go. There's an accountability, isn't there? One day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you accept the, the God of the Bible, you're no long. you can't live how you want to live anymore. There's a standard then that you have to live up to. You can't live into yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now, who is this guy? Who is this man? See? Well, he tells him, doesn't he? And now, this isn't the first time, because remember that was one of the reasons that they wanted to meet with him? Because this guy, Jesus... And, and they probably did a little intel, tried, you know, investigate. They're intelligent people, you know, and they're probably trying to find out now. So what would they know? What would they be able to pull about this man, Jesus, from 
external for, uh, sources besides Paul? Well, if there was a Roman there that happened to have traveled through that area, you would describe that there was this uprising and there was this man who was uh, Galilean and that he started going around the countryside teaching and performing these supposed miracles and that he was their king and that he was then found to be a treasonous criminal and he was taken out and he was executed on a Roman cross. Not going real well for Paul. I mean, if you're thinking about it from the point of that here is Paul trying to then convince that this Jesus is significant. Well, how significant and important could he be if he was a criminal according to the Roman law and crucified? Um, and so he doesn't really address that all, but he does say this, and that's why I think it's kind of interesting a couple of ways he brings this idea of his victory over death. He says, He's going to judge this world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. We know who that is. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So whatever information that they have been able to glean and find out, which, man, those people love to find out new stuff, right? So I'm sure <laughs> that they were able to find out about this Jesus. I, I I'm pretty convinced that they were able to find out who that guy was. And so he tells him, but he's given him assurance because of why. He raised him from the dead. <whistles> wow, you, Paul, you just took it to a whole new level. You just, you just ping, popped it out, and, and all of them. What is so hard about the resurrection? What is it about that? I'm just curious. What are your thoughts? Why, why is the resurrection that difficult? Well, I think it resurrection speaks to spirit, something spiritual that we, we can't see with our eyes. We can't feel. We can't touch. So it's really hard to believe or understand that because it's not something we can understand from a physical point of view. I think it kind of, it, it even boggles my mind to think about sometimes, wrap my head around. It does, doesn't it? But their idols were not alive, so they couldn't die, and they also couldn't be raised. And according to the uh, Epicureans, you just go back to molecules. And so you just pleasure yourself all to no end. There's no judgment. No, no judge. You, you want to do something, you just do it. Yeah, so it's, you can see, now, and also it is true. Um, it's kind of difficult for us to think about because it doesn't happen on a daily basis at all. I mean, it's happened once, and um, well, and then Lazarus, <laughs> that Jesus raised from the dead. But no, no, we've never seen flesh reanimated, uh, unless you like Frankenstein. But that's a book, people. You know, it's not real. But we have this amazing fascination towards a reanimation of tissue, of life, you know, and being able to, and we go, nah, come on, it can't happen. So it is something that is difficult. I was studying is the it, Bible. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, isn't that the same thing that Jesus told Thomas? Christ told Thomas, he said, blessed are those who... Uh, believe without seeing but you have you have to have seen in order to believe uh, absolutely um and it, it took even after they you know what and thomas should have known better right of all the people that it would have been hard to convince it shouldn't have been thomas shouldn't have been any of his disciples chelsea says uh pagan resurrection was weird too then at those times you're right and like made only for gods in some areas. And that's so true, and that's why they could not really comprehend the concept of resurrection. And that's why the Stoics were, I mean, the Epicureans were like, hey, man, well, you got these molecules all in one ball, pleasure it. 
enjoy it. The Stoics, on the other hand, were like, no, you have to be above it. And so, so the idea of resurrection and life after was more of a mythical, and it was something to do more with the gods. It was, it was weird. It's kind of, there's a lot of variation. But what I think is great is the idea that he is, he's not backing away from this because that's what it's about. It's all about the resurrection. Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians 15 when he takes the, the Corinthians there and tries to show them the importance of it because some of them were struggling with it. Um, that there, there were some that were going around saying there is no resurrection of the dead, remember? You know, that... And the Sadducees. No, no, Christians in Corinth. Now, yes, the Sadducees taught that, but in Corinthians, where they should have known better, there were some that were actually, you know, teaching, nah, there's no baptism. There's no raising of the dead. Um, and so Paul had to address it there. So, you know, so over in 1 Corinthians 15, 12, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. We are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. So he goes on, and, and so to me, and then in 19, in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he says, and if Christ we have in if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. And, and I bring that up because their response is natural here. But the other thing is, I've run across this. I ran across this in a Bible study with a student at NMSU that was uh, working on their, I think it's a master's or their PhD. I know it was a, a master's at least, and I've been studying with them. And then they decided, you know, I want to be baptized. And so I was really excited. I'm like, hey, this is great, you know. And then he looked at me and he said, but I don't believe in the resurrection. I had never, never come into, come across that. I mean, because I'm in America, you know, where a culture where everybody has grew up around the idea of Christ. And at some point, somehow, Everybody is familiar with this idea of a resurrection. And that, you know, I mean, if not, at least when you're hunting Easter eggs on Sunday, you probably had something told to you about that that's the day that somebody was raised from the dead. So resurrection wasn't foreign for, to us as Americans and many cultures, Western cultures, but to the Eastern, that, that was just weird. And so I, I was just blown away by that. I couldn't baptize him. And I and I and and I had some people, you know, kind of like, well, you know, you know, you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and personal savior and all that. I said, but it's about the resurrection. You know, I mean, 1 Corinthians 15 just jumped out and slapped me upside the head. And especially yeah. go ahead. If if he's not if he doesn't believe he's going to be resurrected to an eternal you know, to heaven or to hell, then what, what is the purpose of salvation? Well, I think that that's what he says. He says it, let me see here, over in 1 Corinthians 15, then basically let's just eat, drink, and be merry. Right? Just pleasure yourself like, like the uh, Epicureans. Oh, interesting. Because if that's true, there is no resurrection of those who have died, then not only should we be pitied, but we're also, we just need to get over it. There's no judgment. And that's why I love the way that I, when I was reading 1 Corinthians 15 there, how he kept saying, you know, that without him being raised, there's no salvation. And if there's no resurrection of him, there's no resurrection for anybody. So that's pretty, pretty interesting that we come back when we look here that that's exactly what happened here. These people look at him and they just go, mm. 
You know, they mocked him. And then, and then what they say, we'll hear you again on this matter. They didn't say, don't come back. None of us are going to believe what you say. We, we've heard you, but now we're going to respect you and say, just don't come back. They didn't say that. And then there were others that believed and, and, and went with, uh, and followed Paul Silas. It's a very, it's very mixed result. There's a, within this the same as today. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Some say, well, we'll listen to this. We'll continue with you. And some, it said it almost like as if there were some that went ahead and went with him, like, oh, you know, and listen to him, which we do. We only have the name of two people, right? Dionysus and Darmius. Darmius. Wow, Paul. That's all? Yep. You know what? If one, that's plenty. Do we ever hear of a church in Athens? No. <laughs> no. We do, we, now, well, there's two people there, so I don't know. But I mean, <clears throat> and it, is it necessary that you have to, church there to save people no no but you know he never wrote them they never become such a functional group but it doesn't mean that there weren't and that's what i'm saying you know we may not be aware of where they're at and what they're doing but there's two people and we never hear of them following him on and following him they didn't uproot and move and start going to another congregation somewhere but there was, there's this little bitty group, this little seed that's been planted right here in the middle of this, right? Well, any closing thoughts? What kind of comments, criticisms, concerns? Yeah, it says that um, there was others with them. So it wasn't just two people. He just named two. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You're right. Because it does say among whom were also. So, yeah, we just have them specifically. And so you're you're absolutely right. Um, I wanted to point out back in verse 27, where it says that they should seek God, and perhaps they might grope for him. That's, um, I have a new American Standard translation here. It says grope. And I have some other notes from previous studies I've done um, talking about that word grope for him. Um, I have noted here that it's testing by feeling out everything. So if you think about like in the middle of the night, if you get up to go to the bathroom or get a drink and you're in the dark and you're trying to grope your way around the room, you know, you feel for things. Okay, there's the dresser. I know I'm just a couple steps away from the light. I can turn it on. And so my note here is that, you know, that's what we have to do with our faith. We have to feel things out. We have to test and analyze to find the truth. We have to grope for him. And we will, um, you know, be judged. We'll be held accountable for how we go about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I like that word. I was going to actually kind of talk about that. That idea is a beautiful uh, illustration, isn't it, of that, the way you described it. And that's, that's what the Greek word does indicate, um, is this idea of a, a reaching around and going through and not being able to see it. And so you can't see visually, but you f sense and discover as you're going through tactily, right? Um, Jesse made a comment here. She says, I think these worldly believers also can't fight the slave mentality, like can't fight the slave-like mentality. They're too scared to be free and feel safety under the oppression of the worldly ruler and their false gods. Yeah, a lot of people in that group that were listening to him were just like really so set at not wanting to change, right? Um, 
that word groping and I goes back to the idea this and specifically this Greek word comes from the same Greek words used in Homer's Iliad with uh, Cyclops. I'm trying to remember I'm trying to remember the other character in that, but that word when he pokes the uh, eye of the Cyclops on the island to escape. That's the same word. What, what happened when they were trying to escape out of the cave once he had jabbed the spear through his eye? It says that he groped. And so they had to be very careful, but he was groping around trying to find. Um, and that's something that's interesting. I just thought I'd share that. Nothing real significant necessarily, but it just it is that idea that sometimes that's what we are like. You see people that are still blinded by many things around them, but if, if they really were to put their hands forward and spiritually look forward, they, they'll find you. And I think that ties in with Romans 1. Yeah, and with, with what it says that he's not far from, from any of us. If, we're, if we are searching and trying to find him, we're going to find him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. This has been a great class. Good discussion. And especially when things work together. <laughs> it sounds great on my end. I'm excited. Oh, I know. I know you guys put up with a lot. Uh, Dorothy, you came in just in time to enjoy the other end of it. <laughs> you know, we were struggling. We were struggling. Um, it's just a different, little different setup that I have to kind of manipulate. But that's all right. That's all right. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. So if you're, you're with us still on YouTube, I'm, I'm very thankful that you participated with us, and I hope that you were able to get something out of it. I hope that it helped you as well to encourage you to learn also how to interact with people around you that um, don't agree with you um, and how to, I think, premeditate, prethink forward your engagements, to look around at your environment, to, you know, what you see, you know, it doesn't mean it, it, it should become something routine but sin and the things around us that are wrong, we need to be a little offended by it. And that should shape our, our thinking and how that we should then be able to approach and look for opportunities like what Paul did. You know, Paul looked and saw that one statue. Just think of all the statues, but he saw that one. And he found it before he started to engage with them. He understood who he was talking to. He knew their philosophies, and he respected them. He didn't insult them, did he? But he also didn't shy away from the truth. And he delivered the truth in a way that maybe not every one of them was effective, did not affect them, but it did somebody. And that's what it's about. That's what we need to be able to do, is to find these opportunities and mimic kind of the way Paul has done as well. It's not any different. There's a lot of idol worship going on out there through monetary things. And we've reshaping God's word and turned him into something else. It's like a caricature of the actual God. And we need to be those that are going to help others. And I hope that if you're watching again, participating on whatever through Facebook, or you watch this in the future, I hope that it will be useful to you and help you improve your life and help to improve those that are living around you. Um, thank you guys. Thanks for your comments too. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, and you're welcome, Chelsea. She said, thank you. And I, I, I'm excited because it's, it's finally, we're, we're pulling together something that I think can be very helpful to all of us and others around us as well. Um, I will be taking the audio and stripping it out and are taking it and producing a, a podcast, uh, audio. So you'll be able to see it. You can access it through Podbean or through yours, uh, if you're, whatever pod software you're using. Also, you can go to our website, and you can go there. We have the uh, player embedded with the all of them, and as soon as I process it, it uploads instantly. So there's a lot of ways you can find it if you want to share it. Um, share it, please. You know, I mean, it's not out of ego. I, I want people, others than just that at this moment, enjoyed it. That's the beauty of this technology is that now we're able to share it with a lot of people and help them during times that we need it. And we can pull back together through this technology. So let's do it. Let's take this advantage. 
and be excited about our faith. We have an awesome God. We have a God that created everything, and there's no one out there that can touch us that, you know, is going to affect us. They can take away our physical world and all these things around us, but they cannot take away our God, our Father, the one that has given us the best. And this is our world. God created it for his children, and he's allowing through grace and long-suffering for all men to come to him. So while we're here, we should be the most happiest, pleasant people, Christians, that helps and influence those around us. And enough said. I'll keep going. You know, my mouth. I'll just keep going because I get excited and get crazy. Um, but I thank you guys. Uh, if you guys want to hold on Zoom, we can have a little conversation. I'm going to kick off, and then we'll shut it down. And again, thank you uh, so much for joining me. And we'll see you guys next Friday. And we'll be moving on into chapter 18. So if you want to start looking at that, we'll see you. Bye.